In just a moment, I'm going to hand over to Václav Lavac from the Nature Conservation Agency of the Czech Republic in the IENEE network. Um, and he's going to dive into the issue at hand. Uh, just before I do that, I will give the, the floor to Hilda to give some logistical, uh, but don't, just a moment, uh, to give us some, some logistical background um, and instructions. But before I do that, uh, I will just say just briefly why um, WWF, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, uh, Danube Carpathian program, why we are involved in this project and supporting it. Um, a lot of it, in fact, has already been said, including the stories. But I just want to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, this is a very special region. Some years ago, I think it was about 1998, the WF network globally um, identified the most 200, the 200 of the most important eco ecological regions uh, across the world. The, the idea was that if we hold on to the, to the bio, biological diversity in those areas, we will preserve 92% or the, the vast majority of the biological diversity on this planet. Lots of areas that you can imagine, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and places like that. But two of those are also the Danube and the Carpathian ecoregions. So already s almost 20 years ago, WF identified this area as an important one. And the reason why the program that I, that I lead and that many of the people in this room, my colleagues, um, are working for, um, be it in Ukraine, uh, in Romania, uh, in Slovakia, in Hungary, uh, and other places, um, it's really to, to, to try to work for the preservation of the biological diversity and then helping also the countries and the societies work towards uh, sustainable development in the broadest sense. Um, there's been some stops along the way. Some uh, early on we developed together with a number of other um, project partners uh, a first analysis or evaluation of the Carpathians, uh, which eventually partly one of the things that laid the groundwork for the Carpathian Convention. Um, Again, this uh, put a focus on, on what is really special about this region. Um, and especially within a European context, I mean, the fact that we have, depending on how you measure it, uh, up to, let's say, 50% of the large carnivores, the brown bears, the wolves, the lynx, come from this part of the world. Uh, exceptional in that sense, uh, be it forests, but also relative wilderness areas, absolutely exceptional. There are some, some historical, economic, political cultural reasons for this, the long-term development of the region, why it's relatively well-preserved, why we have this exceptional situation. And of course, that is changing. Um, there is development. Um, it's relatively, has less a transportation infrastructure than other parts of Europe. So it's also natural that we will be developing the transportation infrastructure. The question is, can we hold on to our cake and eat it too? Um, can we actually hold on to what is exceptional here? while at the same time ensuring that we have um, you know, better livelihoods for the people here. Recognizing the fact that many, the, the exceptional natural resources are here are also uh, a basis uh, for the well-being, uh, including what economic well-being uh, for the societies here. So how can we make that happen? Um, we've done a lot of work uh, on policies, for example, um, implementing a lot of what we do is all about, in one way or another, about implementing EU policies on nature conservation um, in other areas. Um, this is coming into contact also with transportation policies, um, also in terms of the Carpathian Convention, which was, was, was mentioned, uh, but then also work on the ground um, in places like Maramuresh in northern Romania, um, in, in the Carpathians of, of Ukraine, um, Deva Lugos Highway in uh, Romania, and other places. I mean, there have been specific flashpoints, and in many cases we've um, responded to what we've seen as threats, so suddenly uh, an infrastructure project has come. We have responded to that um, and led some campaigns and so on and made, made life difficult for, for transportation. Um, what I like about this project is that we're stepping beyond that. And I think that's what we need and is ultimately, I think, the vision for the societies and certainly for EU legislation. How can we organize things so that we have our cake and eat it too? How can we do it in the best possible way so that we secure that transportation on the one hand, but at the same time hold on to uh, the natural wealth that we have, which is the basis for, for, for our well-being. And, and so I think this is actually, for, for me, one of the more interesting pro pro projects that we have going on right now, spanning a number of different countries, most of the countries that we're working in, uh, but also doing it in a very positive way. And I think this is, correct me if I'm wrong, Irena especially, um, I think this is the project where we have from the beginning, 
had the greatest um, involvement um, and integration um, of, let's say, the other side. We're coming from the nature conservation side. That's why we exist. Uh, but in this case, from transportation authorities and so on. I think this is, for us, uh, in many ways, a first in, in, a, in a direction which I hope we can move more, not just in transportation, but on energy and so on. So again, not being having negative approaches and being on the barriers uh, against each other, but actually going on the other side and actually saying, how can we solve these problems? How can we do this much more, um, much more um, positively? Um, I haven't had much direct contact with, with Asfinak. I think one person, I think, from Asfinak here, uh, because uh, I don't work so much in, in Austria myself, my colleagues do, but I did have a, I was, I was fortunate to have a conversation some years ago with the then CEO of Asfinak, and it was interesting because, um, you know, there's, there is a, a past, WF was very much on the barricades um, uh, on a number of Asfinak projects, and what he said was that, you know, we have everything set up, we have the bulldozers ready to go in, and then you guys come in and you give us a hard time, you stop us from moving the bulldozers, at least for a time. Uh, he won some, we lost some, we won some, he lost some, but in any case, there was a delay, and it costs a lot of money. And as a result of that, um, Asfinak, I don't know how it is right now, but as a result of that, Asfinak completely changed the approach uh, to planning. So being much more inclusive, trying to make sure that everything is lined up, that we talk to the environmentalists, the local communities, and so on and so forth. They even went to the, to the, he said, to the, to the extent of going beyond what we were pushing for and saying, uh, going to the European Commission and trying to clarify some of the requirements of the nature conservation legislation. Again, you know, for a very practical, pragmatic reason that uh, it's better to know beforehand and to plan for it before you then actually start moving the bulldozers, which, which then costs a lot of money. And I think that's exactly what we need. We need to have those that decision-making has to be well-informed, um, and we have a process for that, and, uh, and, and should also look at the solutions, positive solutions, beforehand, uh, before we actually move forward. And I think we're beginning to see this, um, not only in Austria, fortunately, but also in other places. And I think the fact that we have so many people here from the transportation side is, is a testament to that. I mean, I think from both sides, we're looking for a, a, a strong interest in finding solutions and a way forward. So from that perspective, I mean, I think that's ultimately what is most interesting from our side. I promised I would be short, and I will stop now, and I will ask uh, Hilda to, to give us some logistical uh, details.